Are you ready to eliminate your credit card processing fees? Visit www.pairpayments.com and use code Jake for $250 Visa gift card when you join today. Hey, welcome everybody to the show Under Pressure Podcast. So glad to have you today. We're going to be talking about everything under pressure in business. Uh, I have with me a special guest who is actually just right next door in another office uh, across the hall there, (laughs) my wife, Amy McDaniel. Amy, welcome to the show. So glad to have you. Um, And so Amy, uh, for for those of you listeners that don't know, uh, like I said, she is my wife. We um, work together, both work currently working for Bergflow and um, so, but she is over operations. So I'm on the growth side at the moment and she's over operations and, um, it's a, it's a pretty important role. And we're going to get into that, uh, very specifically here in a little bit. So, um, but I know, uh, everything about Amy, uh, Amy, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Um, well, hello, first of all, uh, as John said, I do operations for Bergflow currently. Um, I don't really know what else there is to know about me, but uh, yeah, I mean, what do you want to know? What do your listeners want to know? That's the better question. <laughs> well, I don't know. They're probably wondering like how the heck uh, you you managed to work with me on a daily basis. So um but I don't know. Uh, tell them where you're from. What, how, how'd you get in this job? How I got into this job is actually a journey um, that uh, the truth of the matter is I kind of fell into the job. I was hired originally as um, Dirk's executive assistant and kind of just grew into taking over operations for the company. Um, through just kind of proving my success there, I go backwards, originally came out of the fitness industry. Um, I do have a degree in public relations and then kind of after college went straight into the fitness industry was in that for several years. Um, and the one thing that I find a little bit interesting about that question is I didn't know that I should be an operator. I don't even know that I could tell you I knew what the, that was, um, you know, maybe even as little as five years ago. But um, coming into this job, I have really learned about like the strength of the skill set and embracing those skills i will say in myself so nice well um coming from uh a degree in in uh, public relations to go into be a fitness instructor and now you're in the business world uh, doing some some operations, uh, which we'll talk about what that is here in a minute. So it's an interesting path. <clears throat> and I'm sure for many of the listeners out there, a lot of these uh, guys and, and gals out there that are in business, uh, why they're listening to this probably is uh, they could be business owners. They could be some of the leadership roles or they could be techs and, and current businesses <clears throat> that they're working in. And I suspect there's a wide variety of listeners out there. And we're so glad that you're here listening to us. And we're going to really dive in to what this uh, operations role looks like. Uh, but there's also something I wanted to talk about a little bit before that. And um, I, I think, and I know that you know this, Amy, um, we, we see a lot of business owners uh, who it's it's a husband and wife duo that end up working together and in the business and on the business, what, what are your thoughts around that? What are your thoughts around, um, 
married couples or dating relationship uh, spousal situations where they work together? It can be the most fun thing, or it can be the least fun part of your job, I think. And there's the, I mean, personally, like, I love being able to go to work with you, but also I think we can both acknowledge that one of the, the hardest things is like, we're not at work anymore. And now we actually have to still have a life together as well. And I know people who specifically owners that that is always the biggest struggle. I mean, everybody tends to bring their work home anyway, whether you work together or not. And then when you're both bringing the same work home, it's just an ongoing battle. Um, but by the flip side, uh, we I was just reading something the other day. And if you look at your marriage as a partnership, building a business together can also be one of the like biggest accomplishments that you could do because it's it's building a business with somebody you really want to be in partnership with too at the same time. And so, again, it could be really super amazing and it can be really super challenging as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that. And I, I think uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I think even talking to the business owners that we uh, interact with on a regular basis uh, in the company and Berkflow, um, those that, and, and most of them, a lot of them, I won't say most of them, a lot of them do work together. Um, it seems that, it's very clear you've got to have that boundary, right? And that's something that you and I are starting uh, to try to figure out. Like, where does the time cut off? When, when do we uh, shut the doors to the office and step out and learning? We are learn, growing pains, learning to figure out that we have to shut off the faucet. We have to close the doors. We have to, to step out of that work role. And um, I know... It's, this is going to sound kind of crazy, you guys, but like we both work from home. So uh, one of the things that I've been doing, and I'm not that successful at it yet, but I literally will find an excuse to get in my truck because we work in the house and I'll drive to go check the mail or go fill up my truck or <clears throat> whatever it is, because it makes me feel like for a moment I'm out of here and there's a switch. Um, and I think that's the key is like, where, where's the switch to flip it off. And now the work time is done, uh, because, um, you know, and we can openly admit there's heated conversations concerning work and things like that, that really don't need to take place outside of, of work time. And it can be detrimental or, I mean, there are times that they're really good conversations, but there has to be a cutoff. Um, so that's. That's something, and, and uh, we hear it from a lot of other business owners and people that work with their their spouses on a regular basis. So, I uh, would love to hear what you guys have to say about it, and uh, whatever platform you're on, you should should uh, comment and just just leave a comment. If you're if you're working with your your husband, your wife, um, what do you think about that? What are, what are your thoughts, and how? Maybe give us some suggestions on. How do you, what are your methods in shutting that down and keeping it shut down? So we'd, we'd love to hear uh, from you guys on that. Any more I think too, that? yeah, one of the dynamics that I always find very kind of just interesting from an outside observation of an operator role, um, a lot of times what I feel like happens is a, a, a husband owns the business and like, I'm just going to play out the scenario. He's not very good at doing payroll or, you know, making sure paychecks get cut on a specific date because we all know that has to happen. Like, he's not very good at those tasks, so he leans on his wife because that's that's who you lean on. When, when the bills need paid at home, I lean on my wife. So when the bills need paid in my business, like, oh, I can just lean on my wife. And so a lot of times, 
in this instance, the wife gets kind of just accidentally pulled into the business. And then she's filling this really important role. And we just had a client not that long ago that it was like, hey, have you actually had a conversation around if she wants to work in your business? Or like, you know, have, have you actually like defined what she wants to do? What she wants to do in the business? Is she even sitting in the right seat? Or did you just tell her that's where she has to sit? And so the dynamics of working together are one thing, but how you came to that or why you're working together, it's a really important conversation to have too. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that that really is important. Do they want to be there? And and then whatever role it is, and I, I, th- I think I feel like most of the time it does kind of lean towards an operating position. Um, but, you know, maybe not, maybe it's, it's uh, something completely different depending on the, the actual business, but uh, regardless, is it something they enjoy? Is it something they just did just because you wanted them to? Um, and what does it look like to either get them in a position that's right for them or maybe even out and doing something else that they want, they actually feel good about and they want to do. So that's a, uh, that's a whole another level of conversation that definitely needs to, to take place, uh, if you're in that spot. <clears throat> so that's good. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's shift gears and let's start talking about this operations role. So I think for a lot of you listeners, you may not know, but Bergflow has a very specific organizational model and it is uh, services operations growth. So CEO, and there's three people beneath them, service, this someone over service, which is the thing in the business that's making you money, whatever your service is. If you're a window washer, it's washing windows, power washer, it's power washing, carpet cleaning, whatever it is, that is making you money. That is services. You're servicing clients. So that is not an operator. I know some of you guys may call it that, but then the operations is what we're referring to where it's the systems or whatever. And I'll get Amy to tell us that very specifically. And then there's growth where, where, how am I getting business? Um, Ads, marketing, um, relationships, all of these things to actually bring business in or balance the business uh, if it's moving too fast or whatever that looks like. So that's, where we divide that up and we call it the SOG model. <clears throat> so operations, let's, let's get into it. Um, tell us what, what is an operator's job? The operations job and the way that we refer to operations I would kind of like to start backwards. A lot of people, when they see the SOG model, the person they automatically put into their operations is their administrator. So whether it's an office manager, whether it's secretary, whether it's an admin, like whatever you call that person, the person who's answering the phone. Yeah, the person who's answering the phone, the person who's, uh, you know, maybe running payroll, maybe doing any of those tasks. Um, And those are all kind of the tasks that we look at when we talk about operational tasks. So it covers HR, it covers, um, what am I working for? Software, some systems, um, just kind of the broad management of all the pieces that it takes, uh, financials oftentimes, all the things that it kind of takes to run a business. some people put scheduling in there. Some people, it's just, there's variations of the, the task. The difference to that definition and what I would say to put it just in simple terms, the difference between an office manager, an admin and an operator is the operator is really a strategic thinker. So if you're the CEO of the business and your goal is to point the direction of where the business is going, it's to cast the vision. The operator is like building the strategy to make that vision come to life. Now in the SOG model, 
you have a services leader and they're going to also be in the strategic seat. Um, so the one thing I always like to tell people is services and growth, they're always kind of a little selfish because they're always looking out for their divisions and what they need to make things happen, which is totally legit. Mm -hmm. As an operator, my job is to look out for their divisions and basically look out for the CEO or the company as a whole. So if growth is saying to, I'm going to bring in $20,000 more dollars and services is saying, um, well, I'm going to need 50,000 more dollars worth of technicians in order to fulfill those orders. Okay. What? we have to build the strategy to make all of those things come to life realistically because we all want more business, but how do we make it happen to where we don't flip everything upside down? And so it's a high level of thinking in terms of like, you have to juggle multiple pieces and you live in a world where like you help directly help the services, you directly help the growth and you directly help the CEO. And you kind of just function in all of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that can kind of make sense. So I don't know. I, I think of it kind of like uh, uh, you think of it as a ship. Um, I was picturing the you got the the captain who's got the binoculars out and they're, they're looking ahead and they're saying, hey, we need to go this direction. And you've got the guy that's actually – down there doing the work who's steering and they're running around and they're pulling sails and they're doing all this stuff. <clears throat> and then maybe the operations are the ones who's actually mapping this out. Like uh, we can't run in shallow waters over here. Um, so we got to stay uh, afloat. We can't wreck. We can't. Uh, so they're, they're actually getting on the map, taking a look and plotting the course. Does that sound somewhat accurate? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. And I think um, there's a there's a role that operations plays with the we'll say services division. Your services division is basically all of your technicians, whatever those technicians are doing, right? Your services leader is leading those technicians and they, your services leader is responsible for like productivity, like making sure people get it done, right? But at the end of the day, when we bring it all together, their productivity has to speak the same language as the growth department's productivity. And so whatever term you want to put in there, we're all speaking the same language well, now I said that backwards. We're all saying the same thing, but how we're defining it, how we're tracking it, how we're making all those pieces come together, they come together kind of in the operational role. So it's a little bit of like the hub and not in the terms of like, oh, you'll fall apart. Well, you might fall apart without your operator, but in the terms of like, an operator kind of touches everything and they're kind of just the filter of, like you said, like looking out for, there's a giant rock here. I know that's the direction we're going, but like we can't just make a straight line. And so really just navigating everything. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So would you say what, what level of importance is having a good person in the op operation role? I always think that's a really funny conversation. So in bird flow, we teach like your first hire of a high level leader as an operator. Hmm. The reason behind that, and I, d I do agree with that in a very high level the reason is oftentimes an operator is a very strategic minded person. So as a business owner, 
and really just as a human being in general, we all have these like, great ideas, but if if you're a visionary person, you're probably not a strategic person. And so making those ideas come to life, but you can't go talk to your technician in the field to help you bounce ideas off of each other and like figure out how we're going to make this happen. And so having an operator who has that kind of strategic mindset, it really just gives you another brain in the business to say like, hey, let's have a conversation and like hammer this out and bounce it around a little bit to see what the next step is going to look like or what's realistic or, you know, if we want to grow to a million dollar business, what does that do to our bottom line and have these very high level conversations. Again, this is where as an operator, when you touch all pieces of it, you can have those kind of conversations more often. And so I do think it's a really, really important hire. I think also in general statement, this is a general statement, so nobody get offended, but most CEOs are not good at operational tasks. It's no different than what we were talking about where like they're pulling their wife in to make sure payroll gets paid on time or they're, you know, they're just not good at those kind of tasks. And so the quicker you can offboard the things that you're not good at, the more successful your business is going to be as well. Could see that. Yeah. And I, I feel like uh, <clears throat> most people starting off businesses that we're talking about these service businesses, um, you know, they're, they're working in the business. They're, you know, it's got to start somewhere and it usually starts with one, maybe two people uh, and may, you know, but pretty simple. So they're doing these jobs themselves. And I, I'm guessing that's probably one of the things that's going to make it more difficult and why they have to pull their wives in or whatever that may be. And it may be the opposite. Uh, don't, don't let us get into gender stereotyping people. It could be ladies. You might be out there doing the work and you're making your husband do the operations side of things. I don't know what that looks like, but they're so consumed with so many hats and they're trying to pass a hat along. And that's kind of that easier one. Well, I can do the running around and I can do the servicing and I can even go out and get some business, but I cannot do these other tasks and get all this accomplished. So can you help me kind of thing? Um, uh, so yeah, I could, I could see where the sooner, the more quickly you can get someone in that spot to officially take it and begin to run with it, then it does actually free you up. And that's kind of a natural progression. It frees you up to focus more on the service and operations and then begin or service and growth and then begin to, who can I get for these roles? Um, so yeah, it sounds like it's a pretty important role. Um, so if it's such an important role, what, what are, what are some of the traits that someone should have that would make them a great person for this role? What does it look like? Well, I also want to add to what you were just saying that operations is a huge hire, but in almost every case, pen to paper, return on investment, they're a non-revenue generating role. So you're hiring a power washing technician, they're gonna go out and do power washing jobs and make you money. But the way you can calculate return on investment for an operator is stress level, energy level, and time. And so, I mean, I don't know, but I've been around a lot of CEOs and I've putting a date on payroll, like my payroll has to get paid is a really hard thing for them to grasp. And so that's just one of those things that like, hey, if you don't have to think about that every month, that is like a stress that is a really big stress off your plate. That's a return on investment. And so I think sometimes it's hard to gauge those kind of things because it's like, oh, well, it makes more sense for me to go hire a technician or it makes more sense for me to go hire somebody that's bringing business into my company on paper. But to your mental and your health and the health of your business, there is a return on investment. So I think that's really important. 
Um, as far as who you're hiring, this is kind of interesting as well because not every CEO is the same. And I think for me, what I've kind of observed is you want to hire an operator that is similarly paced, but has the almost the opposite skill set as you. Um, we have one client who's a CEO who's actually very operationally mind, minded, and he's really good at kind of the operational strategy side of things. And so in order for him, if he chooses to sit in the CEO role, he actually needs to hire an operator that's going to be a little less strategic because you can just imagine if you put two very strategic people together, they're going to never, they're just going to sit and build strategy all day and there's not going to be very much action. Yeah. And so that that's kind of probably a rarity. Most CEOs are definitely more vision caster people and a lot less strategic. And so you do want to look for somebody who has a strategic kind of mindset. Um, but also, again, like someone who runs at the same pace as you, um, Dirk, the CEO of Birdflow, he runs fast. I mean, we move fast. We do a lot of different things. I love it. Not everybody could keep up with him, but also not, not every CEO is like that. And so a profile that is complementary to your own is the most important thing because the other part is, again, as an operator, when you're touching, you have so much information in the business, you're probably going to talk, have more conversations with the CEO than anyone else in the business is. Now, his services leader might report to him, his growth leader might report to him, but they can have kind of like one conversation, build the strategy, go manage the task, and it's it can just kind of be left at that. Come see me when you have problems. Whereas for me, like I don't know that there's very rarely a day that I don't have some sort of conversation with Dirk around financials or time or you know this person needs this. What do we? How do we juggle this? What do you think about that? You know just any number of different things in managing that day to day. So you're going to have a really close relationship with this person. Um, so it's, it's very important that you're complimentary as well, but also complimentary and also opposite, if that makes much sense. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I could see that. Um, what, uh, what, do you, what so how are you you say like this profile um, and how are you going to figure that out how do you find out <clears throat> how you complement and what 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 do y'all do or what do you suggest i mean cuz that's that's a difficult thing just to go out and ask people like hey um, i like the color blue um, so when i talk about profiles we we use a tool called the acumax index it's a I'm going to say it wrong. It's a wiring assessment that gauges four different points and just kind of how you function, what environments you like to work in, what environments you thrive in. I'm not the expert on it, so I won't go into much more detail than that, other than um. The pieces of it that it gauges, and I'll, I'll put it into perspective in the relationship between operator and CEO. Um, I talked a little bit before about speed, and that's one of the things that the Acumex gauges, and I'm putting it in super layman's terms, again, because I'm not the expert, but the speed at which you like to move and the speed at which you like to change. So, uh, I was on a call earlier. There's people that are planning projects nine months out. I'm happy if I can get a project nine weeks out, <laughs> but 
like that's fine because I can function in that environment as well. And so that is really important. That is where Dirk and I match is we can we can both run at the same level and keep up with things. If he's changing his mind about something or we change direction or we pivot, we talk about pivoting all the time. We're good with pivoting. Then I can pivot the strategy equally as quickly and it still works. Um, the other place that we do match is, I don't remember what they call it, but it's like social interaction and it, how much, um like engagement you need uh dirk always uses the example of if he sends me an email or i send him an email because we need something <laughs> there's very rarely like a hey or hello or how are you or anything like that like there's very rarely an introduction it's just like can you give me this by tomorrow thanks bye and so again like we match in that perspective to where I don't need a lot of like to talk. I just want the tasks. I want you to tell me what you need and I'll deliver them. And he works well with that. Um, again, that is something that on either level, the CEO or the operator, not everybody is gonna be like that. So you wanna make sure that you are cohesive in like how you want to work. If you have an operator that like wants to have a lot of conversation around something, you're going to have to be able to do that. It's going to be very important. Um, the next two are really where the operators kind of thrive. And that is a, basically systems and processes and task oriented. Um, so having somebody that is a task person or a system person that's very um, like, okay, we're we like talking about project management, for example. Okay, like we have to get steps one, two, three, four, five done. They're going to keep you on track and they're going to make sure you get steps one, two, three, four, five done. I'm a little bit less like that. Like I might do step one, then five, then five, then three, and I jump around a little bit, but that's where finding somebody that compliments you if you like to really throw a wrench in things and somebody that's going to hold you on course of no, we, we have to accomplish it in this order. Um, and then the D drive is really just kind of the strategy level. I think I don't know of any successful situation where an operator would not be a strategic minded person. So that's kind of where that comes in. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and, that Acumax, it's it's pretty interesting, um, and I got to learn a little bit more about it. Um, but it definitely, what I saw from it was, um, it can really see where people live in their realm, and so it makes you communicate a even better in that sense. Um, from what I found, so yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I think that's interesting on the on that side of operations and, and, and really that's probably going to play in the role for every position has a specific profile or someone that you go, you're going to want to develop, um, for that position. Uh, you mentioned like social profile, like I want to be social. I want to be out. I want to be amongst people. Um, and that makes this what I'm doing here. <laughs> difficult. Now it's a little easier if I can get on a podcast or I can communicate with someone or whatever. Um, but yeah, there, there are certain areas where, uh, I'm guessing it's, it's going to be a lot, you're going to fit in a role much better. So that's, that's interesting. Um, so this operations, um, what, what should an owner, who's going to hire this role, what should they kind of expect really from their operator? So this is an interesting conversation as well. I just had with um, one of the CEOs that we're actually working with. There's 
certain again like coming back to the tasks that an operator is going to do one of the things that we always kind of like bump up against people in is financials um a really good operator should have a really good grasp of your financials now that doesn't necessarily mean like i don't do our books per se we have a bookkeeper i oversee the bookkeeper um but i am responsible for reporting things like a pnl um, i'm responsible for i worked with dirk in putting together our pro forma um, i look at our month over month i look at our uh now i just totally lost the name of it but there's about five reports every month that our bookkeeper sends us. I look over them all. I'm responsible for reporting on them. Therefore, I'm responsible for understanding them also. Hmm. Financials is one of those things that a really good operator can take off your plate. But if you don't already have a little bit of a grasp, it's really hard to I can't take something off your plate if it's not on your plate to begin with. So there's this role of like the things and it's it's no different than like say project management, for example. Everything, I don't care if you run a $10,000 company, you have projects that need to happen and need to be designed and laid out and mapped out and managed. But if you're not seeing it that way, then it's hard to recognize that that needs to be taken off of your plate and delegated to somebody else. And so that's where there's a, like, do you bring an operator in to point out all these things for you? Or do you get clear on your business first before you bring an operator in? And I think that there's, a middle ground to where you know what to ask for out of somebody, but you don't necessarily, I mean, if you know that you're after, you're asking for a pro forma, but you don't even necessarily, you've never built a pro forma, that's okay. Like, I know I need one. I've never done it, but I'm going to pay somebody else to do it. Like, that's fine. Um, so I think there's, Basic terms, HR, they're going to run HR to a very, very high level. Like you could get to be a pretty big company anymore and have a person in your company running HR. There's a lot of software systems that take care of a lot of the legalities and stuff like that for you. Um, so they're going to run HR. They're going to do a lot with your financials. Um, Software systems, we talked about that a lot. Somebody just take that off, uh, whether it's your booking system. I might not run a booking system, but I'm gonna know the booking system to where when it breaks, I don't need the technician in the field trying to solve the software issue. I can help troubleshoot it and navigate it, stuff like that. Um, incorporating in HR, there's also a level of team management whether it's you know making every making sure you recognize everybody's birthdays making sure you know people are being appreciated bringing the team together for certain things like coordinating that kind of stuff also and then i think there is just the kind of basic uh office tasks who's answering the phone who's you know working the emails who's communicating with customers um client care in our business client care falls under operations uh building systems is a big one and not necessarily implementing systems but helping build the systems out there's a lot of tasks like that that i consider tasks that are all going to fall into operations and so finding somebody who you don't necessarily want to go hire an HR specialist and then expect them to run your software systems. So it's kind of a generalist position, meaning they're going to touch a lot of different things. Um, 
But there's a level of also outsourcing it. Like I said, we outsource our books, for example, but I do oversee the bookkeeper. And so there's a high level of leadership involved in it as well. Nice. <clears throat> well, definitely a, <clears throat> a busy role, a lot going on. And it sounds like it is a lot more important than uh, probably what a, a lot of people think. And uh, very key and very pivotal in, in the success of your company. So I, I do think uh, it sounds like, you know, if you guys out there listening, you know, running your companies or whatever, like even if you're not, if you're working in this company and, and you know your company does not have one of these operators, then it may be a good time to make some suggestions and see about what does this mean? How, how do I How do I get one? Where do I get one? How can I look into this profile thing and figure out uh, this operation side. Uh, so I, I like to wrap things up a little bit with uh, what's a, what's something um, someone who's in this operations role, for example, what's something you would suggest early on when they get that role that is done as they're entering it, or as soon as they get there, what should they, what, what's a should do like as quickly as possible if they're, entering this role. Dang, that's actually a hard one. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing is define the role and I don't know, I'm trying to think of how to best to say this. I would say systematize the role. There is pieces in operations that it is super, super easy to get stuck in the weeds and doing the tasks and lose sight of, because there's a lot of tasks. There's a lot of little things that have to happen. And it takes away from your value, as I talked about earlier, of that extra mind in the business. Like if you're so preoccupied from in doing the task, you're not functioning at a level of like, how are we accomplishing the vision? So that's kind of the mistake that I see. And my answer to that is systematize it as quickly as possible, document your systems, and as soon as you can, whether it's a VA, whether it's an assistant, whether it's a bookkeeper, no matter, like whatever it is, just start outsourcing those systems. Because to, and again, what I talked about in the beginning is we're not talking necessarily about like an admin type person here. They're super important too. And I've had an assistant that works under me that serves more of that role. But in order for me to function at the leadership level, I can't get caught up in the task. And so I think that's really important. Nice. Good advice. So what about maybe something they should avoid as early on as possible? Isn't that what you just asked me? <laughs> no, I said it should do. So that was the uh, well. I do. think I answered it with the void. <laughs> <laughs> Avoid getting caught up in the task and okay. do it by systematizing. I think I answered both of them. Okay. Okay. Avoid getting caught up in the tasks. Yeah, that's good. And, and do the systems. Get the systems going. That's good. Good advice. And I think for the business owners or CEOs or whatever you want to call yourself, the advice is really the same. If you don't have an operator, avoid getting caught up in the task. Like, don't get so distracted by the tasks that you're not casting vision or moving towards the goal of your company. Yeah, and you know, uh, just interviewed Dirk not long ago, and we talked about working on the business versus working in the business. And I think that's uh, that's something that many business owners find themselves guilty of it, because it's a natural occurrence that they're going to work in the business because that's what they've been doing. That's how it started. Um, how do they get themselves out of that where well, they can work on the business more rather than ride inside of it? And so it, it just doesn't get done. Um, 
So that's good. Any last thoughts? I have lots of thoughts, but none of them are probably useful at this point in time. <laughs> well, hopefully now everyone has a little bit better understanding kind of what this operations role potentially could be for them in their company. And thank you for coming on the show and uh, being willing to explain it and, and give people that, that sense of understanding. Um, you guys, if you want to learn more, comment, make sure you're liking, you're subscribing, uh, you're sharing. Uh, if you have questions, comment, any whatever platform you're on, comment, let us know. And uh, hopefully we can get to those and we can answer those for you. Um, and go to Bergflow.com and check it out. And uh, we'll be posting this on there. Uh, and, and you can even just see kind of how we have we have in on bergflow.com you can go and see how we have things set up and how we do things uh and you can sneak in the back door we won't even know you're there uh but just go look at it and um but thank you amy for coming on the show and uh in the future maybe we'll have you back on and we can talk a little bit more in depth about what it's like working together and some other operational things absolutely Awesome. Everybody out there, thank you so much for listening to Under Pressure Podcast, where we discuss all things business that are under pressure. Have a great day.